<laughs> That's a good question, you know. I said, because every kid's a favorite. So I, I get that one out of the way pretty good. But, you know, how did Esther become queen? Ask your mother. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> you know, it's good. They're thinking. And they're thinking, you know. Some of these questions, they're good. Well, we're in Philippians 4 today. Always fun. I'm glad we started doing that. Glad that I get that chance to just spend a few minutes with the kids and just hear what's in their heart and encourage them in the Lord. Now let's pray. Then we'll get into the Lord, we uh, prayers have gone up already. But Lord, I, I have it on my heart too just to pray for this conflict in Ukraine. Pray for the leaders, especially, and especially Vladimir Putin. Lord, I know the best thing that can happen is through all the fear and all the difficulty, all the greed, whatever it is that's motivating him. Lord, that I know the, the main need he has is a rightful relationship with you. And I just pray, Lord, that someone somewhere, somehow, could speak to his heart about the evil of what is going on and about the blessing there is in knowing you. So Lord, we pray. Pray for the people that are in bomb shelters and Lord, fearful. Pray that uh, you would be with them. And As we mentioned in Sunday school, there are even people there from Operation Christmas Child who were there to give out shoe boxes. People who are trapped, who don't normally spend time there. So many difficulties there. And then here at home too, we've still got COVID and all the uh, things that go with that, people who are sick and struggling and trials that go on. We thank you for the progress Leroy is making and look forward to him being back with us soon. Get him home, Lord. Get him healthy. Help him to walk. Lord, may the, the exercises strengthen his legs, strengthen his ankle. And Lord, get him back. I know <coughs> he longs to be home. I can't imagine how, how deeply he desires to be back to normal. Grant his wish, Lord, and the wish of his kids and his grandkids, Lord, his dad. Please, Lord, do that. Lord, we hear that we might look into your word and that you might encourage us. Lord, we're living in crazy times and we need to make some sense of it. And the only sense it ever can be made is getting your perspective. So we pray, Lord, that you would give us your perspective as we consider your word now. Please bless our time. Bless the kids downstairs. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, Philippians 4, 1 says, Therefore, my beloved and long for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. A couple of beloveds in there, but it starts with therefore. And, you know, we read last week um, this verse because it is a, you know, anything that begins with therefore links back to what came before it, right? So, we kind of jump back, um, or went ahead, and now we'll jump back. But in this epistle, it's an epistle of thanks to Paul's friends in Philippi, and he has encouraged them to be united, to esteem others better than themselves. Um, he's used the example of our Lord Jesus as humility and as a, a perfect example of how they and how we ought to live. Um, he's exhorted them to beware of the Judaizers and the legalists and to keep their eyes on the prize. And the prize was uh, the last thing we read in chapter 3 last week. What's the prize that we need to keep our eyes on? This fact, you know, verse 20 of chapter 3 said, For our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body. Oh, I'm looking forward to that. According to the working by which he is even is able even to subdue all things to himself. To have a new body, an upgrade, a major upgrade, no longer subject to weakness and sin and sorrow and depression and 
pain and suffering and all those things that were promised that heaven will be. I'm looking forward to that. And with that in mind, and in addition to everything else he's written, he says, Therefore, my beloved and long poor brethren, my joy and crown, soul, stand fast in the Lord. Because the only way we can stand and stand fast is in the Lord. That's where the security is. That's where the strength is. Standing on the rock. On our standing in the Lord. That is it. You know, difficult days may be ahead. We know gas prices are rising. Unbelievable, isn't it? And we've got this crazy conflict in Ukraine. We've got food costs rising. Uh, there's a threat of a cyber war. Now, I don't know much about a cyber war and what it will do, but, you know, from what they're saying, there's the potential that they could knock out the power grid or that they could, you know, stop the um, flow of oil or whatever in pipelines. They can shut those things down. Uh, I even heard someone say that, you know, if they did it just right, planes would crash. I mean, I, I don't know what, what they can do electronically in this day and age. But it just didn't sound good. You know, just, why don't they just leave all the alone, you know? And we still have this supply line crisis. You know, I've been to stores where the shelves are empty. That never happened in my whole life. We've been through some stuff, but I've never seen it where there aren't goods on the shelves. And we have inflation, rampant inflation. It's diminishing the value of the dollar, and it's putting more and more people under that threshold of what is poor. You know, taking the middle class and making it poor. It's interesting, but under inflation, how that works, that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. That's what's happening. It's a crazy time. It's perilous times. And yet, you know, it's indicative of the last days. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, it said that. In the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of their own selves, and so on. And it talks about that. In fact, what he says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, in light of all the craziness that's going on, you know, they will... Uh, he says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.10, But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, and at Iconium, and Lystra, what persecutions I endured. And out of them all the Lord delivered me, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. I don't see that on a bumper sticker very much, that verse. You know, we're all going to suffer persecution. He says, evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, but you must continue. And that's the word, I underline that in my Bible, that word continue. You must continue in the things which you've learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. You know, we've got to continue. We've got to stand in the Lord in this crazy time. We must stand. Um, you know, it's all right to be aware of what's going on in the world, but I can find even in myself. Uh, actually, I see it quicker in Jean if I, I put on the news accounts of this war in Ukraine. She, she gets overwhelmed by it. She doesn't want to see it. And you know, we can take in too much of that stuff. It's all right to glance at it, but keep our eyes firmly focused on the Lord because He is our security. We're going to keep our eyes on and so he goes from that, you know, talking about therefore, what happened in the past. Verse 2, he says, I implore, that's a name, Uadiah, and I implore Sintik to be of the same mind in the Lord. Now, I don't know who these two ladies are. I don't know what they did or were doing. But I'm thinking if I had the privilege of having my name written down in Scripture, I wouldn't want it to be in this context. Uh-oh, you know. Obviously, they were not of the same mind. We're not really given a lot of insight into what was going on there, but evidently there was a squabble in Philippi between these two ladies. And you know how that can happen when you're in a squabble with someone? Maybe they're trying to gain allies, so you got to help me, and you know. And you can see how there can be such a, a difficulty that can arise. 
And, you know, Paul, like I said, he doesn't take sides. He doesn't give us a hint to what the issue was. He just urged them to find unity, to be of the same mind. I implore them. That's a pretty strong word. To be of the same mind in the Lord. Because divisiveness is so devastating sometimes. It can really lead to such difficulty. And so, you know, this is his urging here. In Matthew 18, there's a process um, in verses 15 through 17. talks about, you know, if your brother offends you, go to them. Go, just you and him alone. And so talking about keeping it small, just go and talk. And I wonder if these two had gotten together and tried to work it out. It didn't work. It says, and then if that doesn't work, you know, take somebody with you. And go, and it's just the small circle. Let's just try to deal with it and see if we can work this out. And if not, you know, you keep going further. And ultimately it says, if not, tell it to the leadership of the church, is what it meant. It says, tell it to the church, but it's the leadership. And I wonder if that's what process was followed or not. We don't know. But certainly if Paul heard about it, this was not just a, a simple squabble. There was something difficult going on there. And he's like, okay, you two, <laughs> get together, be of the same mind in the Lord. Work it out. And then he goes on in verse 3, and he says, And I urge you also, true companion, we don't know who the true companion was, whether it's an individual or maybe it's the whole church, I don't know. But I urge you also, I help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Look, somebody got to do something here. Help these ladies. Help them to reconcile. Whenever there's division, it really does hinder the work of the gospel. And so get them together. Get them on the same page, you know. And it, it wasn't as serious. If you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it wasn't as serious as what was going on in Corinth. But, you know, they had it going. They had trouble there. Corinth is uh, the poster child for problems. You know, that's why we have the the book of 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, because Paul was always having to deal with something there, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he says this, Dear any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints. And so we see in that verse alone what Paul's expectation is. Don't be taking somebody in the church to court, in other words. Don't be suing them. Don't do that. Can't you just go before the saints? Can't you just go and talk, find somebody that you both believe could solve the problem and listen to them? You know, he goes on to say, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? So you should be able to handle a conflict within the body. Because we're going to judge the world. That's quite a revelation in and of itself. And then verse 3, do you not know that we shall judge angels? They're a higher order, a higher level of creation than us mere humans are. And yet, we're going to judge them. How much more than things that pertain to this life? Verse 4 says, if then you have judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? Why go to a worldly judge somewhere who doesn't have a clue what the scripture says? Why go into them? And in verse 5, I say this to you, shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one, who will be able to judge between his brethren? But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. Now therefore it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. So you see Paul's heart as he wrote to the Corinthians, and, and back here in Philippians, that's his heart. You guys, work it out. If you've got a conflict, let's talk about it. Let's see if we can't resolve it. And many times we can. Often we can. You guys seem to do that well, though. As far as this is a body, I never hear any problems. So you guys are all perfect, so obviously everything's going very, very well, and that's a wonderful thing. But, you know, should something be of difficulty, if there is some issue, you know, we've got some great guys here, 
you know, Ben and Ben and Jeff, they're the guys that have been uh, put in authority here with me. Those are the good guys to run things by. Look, I got this issue. Can you help me? Give me some insight, some wisdom. You know, we'll take you to the scripture and we'll see what the, the Word of God says about this, that, or the other thing. And that's what Paul's doing here. You know, verse 3 again, I urge you also to companion out these women who labored with me in the gospel. <coughs> They're great ladies. They've worked with me. I love them. They're wonderful. Can't we help them out? Can't you just solve the problem? Help them out with Clement also with the rest of my fellow workers. Let's get everybody together whose names are in the book of life. Look, we're all going to heaven. We're going to spend eternity together. We might as well work this out. It's not like we're going to be separated very long even if we separate. We might as well figure this out. But what a great honor to have your name written in the book of life. You ever think about that? <coughs> what an important thing. It's the foundation for who we are, who we should be. So don't fight each other. Your family. That's what Paul's saying. Let's get together. And then he says in verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord. Always. <laughs> and again I say, rejoice. And that's the theme of this whole letter anyway. A celebratory letter, really. Um, to rejoice. And you know, if that's where your heart is, where you're just rejoicing in the Lord, so grateful that He saved you, so grateful that your sins are forgiven, so grateful for all the good things that He's done for you. Well, we'll have to argue with some of them. If your focus is on what God has done for you, rejoice. Be happy. <laughs> Understand what God has done for you. Rejoice in the Lord. And then, you can't have these kind of difficulties. I think that's part of what he's saying. But it's a, it's a great thing to do, too. And then he says in verse 5, Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Look, Jesus is coming back. You don't have time to be fighting and fuming and all this stuff. Don't be doing that. He's coming back. But let your gentleness be known to all men. Now this word gentleness, or if you have a, a King James Bible with you. It says moderation as opposed to uh, I guess extreme being an extremist you know, be moderate, be gentle it also can mean or be translated patience or softness or forbearance, uh, modesty but why gentleness? Why you know, I mean it's one of the fruits of the spirit from Galatians 5 one of the Fruits is gentleness. It's good to be gentle, I guess. There's not a lot of gentleness in the world, though. I think that maybe there wasn't then. I don't think there is now. And that doesn't mean that we don't confront and contend. It just means that at times when we have to, don't be a jerk. Don't be a jerk about it. I was in Martin's the other day, and I'm walking down this aisle, and there's a guy in the next aisle. There's a big thing there, so I can't see him. This is one of those places where you can see through. And he drops an F-ball. I don't like that. I don't like swearing anyway. So I said, watch your mouth. I think it's okay to do that, you know, to confront things. I heard it again, so I thought he was deaf, so I said it a little louder. <laughs> Figured maybe he would hear me. Then I get quiet. And we get down the aisle about halfway, and this guy comes around the corner. And I'm sizing him up quickly out of the peripheral vision, you know, I didn't really, I kind of looked at him briefly. I'm thinking, yeah, he can crush me like a bug. <laughs> He's a guy. But I don't care, because that just bugs me. You know, and you need to deal with those things. You know, he didn't say anything. We were around the corner, there was another guy, that was the direction I was headed. There was another guy in that aisle. He looked at me, but he didn't say anything. I don't know which one of them it was. I don't care which one of them it was. We need to confront stuff. We're going to stop being so tolerant of things like that. We need to say things. We need to do things. They say enough. You people are crazy. You know, some of the things going on in our culture that we're accepting, we, we don't need to accept that. We shouldn't. You know, so we do need to contend. But still, let your gentleness be known to all men. Not that you do it in a way that is combative, 
or confronting, you know, in, a, in such a way that <laughs> it leads to aggression. We don't want to do that. But still, we do need to confront and intend. It's important. And so Paul, he lays these little details out. And we get to the next one. This next one in verses 6 and 7 is about prayer and the importance of a prayer life. And you notice it begins with a command. It's not a suggestion. It says, be anxious for nothing. That's more of a command. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. This is one of my favorite passages, one I memorized years ago. It was so important for me, because I, I have a tendency towards anxiety. Not that I have anxiety per se, but worry. I, I can be concerned about things, and it's good for me to be reminded that I have no need to be anxious. It's a hard thing. And I've been all the way to the extreme. I'm, I'm putting me as a mom in a bomb shelter in Kiev, Ukraine. I think there may be a... I, I think I would have some anxiety there. I think there would be a tendency to. There's, there's some circumstances that are really difficult. To, this is very hard to not be anxious at times. But yet, you know, what an exhortation. Don't let anything... Tweak your brain, I guess, is the way it is. Isn't that what anxiety is? Because anxiety, it's, it's debilitating. And really, anxiety comes from putting our eyes on circumstances and inflating the significance of the circumstance. It can lead us to that place where we believe that God can't help us. This problem is bigger than God. It diminishes God. It exalts us. And that's what anxiety does. I've got to deal with it. I've got to control it. I've got to somehow get over this. I, you know, instead of just falling on our face before God and saying, God, this is just too big. I can't handle it. Help. And we turn it over to God. Let's think about God for a minute. You know, it's, it's, you, we forget. It's so easy to diminish God. But, you know, one of the places I love to go when I think about God is think about how fearfully and wonderfully we're made. Consider our body. You know, I think about that. We started with just one cell. This always amazes me when I think about that. And that splits, grows, and everything, and pretty soon arms form and legs form. How does that happen? This is one little cell. Hair comes out, fingernails. Aren't those amazing things? You could cut them and they don't bleed. You know, it's made of but if I cut my finger, it bleeds, you know. I mean, you think of how we're made. Think of all the systems. Pancreas, the liver, lungs, the heart, the nervous system, the digestive system, one of my favorites. I do like for the intake. But anyway, the digestive system is amazing. The circulatory system. You know, you think about how we're made. It's amazing. How does the same cell that makes an eyeball make a fist? You know? And think of stomach acid. How does that get in there? And how does that all work? I mean, uh, it's amazing. And all the information to make all of that system comes out of that, the DNA in that little cell. That's astounding to me. I don't understand science that well anyway. I, I don't know a whole lot about biology or chemistry or any of that stuff. But I think even those that do, I can't understand how a doctor or a scientist can be an unbeliever. When you look at how amazing these things are. Just the human body, but we can go beyond that. Let's, let's look at animal life. It's the same idea, just a different thing, you know. And all the systems that come out of that, the claws, you know. You think of an elephant and its size. You think of a mouse and its size. You know. It's amazing to me. Or plants. You know, a tulip and a marigold. I'm looking forward to those things. I like spring. Or grass. Or trees. You know, a pine tree. Or a little seed. When I was in California years ago, um, 
We went to Sequoia National Park and I picked up, not supposed to, but they did, one of the little cones off of the General Sherman, the biggest tree, the most mad, what, a, what an awesome display that is. But that's a little thing. It's just a, well, I mean, it's in your hand. But it has, you have to have a fire in order to open that up and the seed is actually inside the cone. And so wildfires are important for them. But you just think of that. God, why did you design it that way? I mean, so many things. This creation moment that we typically do on a Sunday and all the little aspects of creation that we can discover. It just fascinates me. And you think about the God who created it all. Think of outer space. Isn't that amazing? You know, the, the planets and such. And yet, our privileged planet. Because scientists have looked all over the universe and they can't really find a place like planet Earth. We're unique. And we are unique. Because this is the center of God's attention. It's amazing. But all of this that God created, he, you know what? He's pretty big. He can do a lot of good stuff. And that's why I think, you know, when we get God in the right place where he needs to be, and us in the right place where we need to be, he's pretty awesome. And we can turn these things over to him. When we understand that he does hear, that he does care, that he's on our side, that he loves us. <clears throat> the problem, you know, is we forget that. And he says, you know, be anxious for nothing, <clears throat> but in everything, everything. Pray about everything. There isn't, that's pretty inclusive. That's a lot. That's a pretty broad category. Pray about everything and everything. God wants to hear from us by prayer and supplication. Now, prayer is kind of the general word that talks about communing with God. Supplication is a specific thing. God, something we want God to do for us. And so we bring our supplications before him. God, I would love for you to do this or do that or do the other thing. Now, the idea... You know, is that he answers prayer and that he will listen. And we know based on his word that he does. But you know, there's a verse, John 16, 24. The navigators titled it the assurance of answered prayer. And it says, Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. There's one condition in that verse. That condition is ask. There's so many people have. <coughs> So many Christians don't pray, or don't pray like we, we should. That put me in that category. One condition. Ask. And when we ask, and you will receive. And you know, we're talking about rejoicing in verse 4. There is nothing that makes me rejoice more than knowing that I have asked God of something, and He has answered that prayer. What a wonderful thing it is. That will bring us to the point of rejoicing. But he says with thanksgiving. You know, that's part of it too. To have gratitude. Because gratitude is a powerful controller of attitude. <laughs> if we have a thankful heart. If we're just thankful. It's amazing how helpful that is. To keep us from <coughs> whining to keep us from complaining, to keep us from discouragement, just to be thankful, whatever the circumstance. Lord, thank you. Thank you for what? That I'm in it? No, but then I'll get out of it. Because everything's seasonal in life. Sooner or later, it all ends anyway. But to be thankful. Because our Father, our Heavenly Father, is loving. He is all-powerful. He knows what He's doing. But I like that verse that part of the verse 2 that says, let your request be made known to God. That doesn't mean that God's going to do everything I ask. But I figure I can at least tell him what I want. Kind of like the kids when they come to you, they tell you what they want. <laughs> they don't have a problem with that. And that's really the relationship that we have as an example. I communicate my desire to God. I tell him what I, I would like. I don't try to tell him what to do. But I, I tell him what I'd like him to do. I don't think there's any, I think that's what they're saying. Let him know. Let him know what your concern is. Let him know what your desire is. Let your request be made known to God. And for me, <coughs> and I pray this for you, 
when you really get to that place where you understand that God hears you, and then you pray to Him, it does take the anxiety away. And it does in its place, as verse 7 says, and the peace of God, that peace comes in, which surpasses all understanding. And it will guard your heart and your mind. It will guard you. <coughs> it will protect you. Spurgeon defined the peace of God this way. He said, the un I, I just love the way he worked. We were talking about that at Sunday school. He's so eloquent and I'm so not. But he said, The unruffled serenity of the infinitely happy God. The eternal composure of the absolutely well-contented God. That's what's ours. That's the peace that we can have. The peace of God. Where we are. Serene, unruffled serenity. <coughs> and where we can have contentedness. Well-contentedness. It's ours by faith through prayer. This serenity, this contentedness. When we understand who God is, and we understand that He's on our side, that He is for us. <coughs> and how wonderful to have peace when the circumstance calls for panic. <coughs> because when we tend when we panic, we, we lose or we can lose sanity, I suppose. We can do things that we really shouldn't. We can overreact. We can really do wrong. But having that peace from God, it guards our heart. It guards our mind, Scripture says. And it keeps us from rash behavior or wrong actions. And that's what we want. So we need to make prayer a priority in our lives, if it isn't already. It needs to be important. And there's nothing, like I said, there's nothing like praying for something and then see it happen. That's just such a joy. <coughs> just a wonderful thing. And that needs to be our experience. That, that's what God wants to be our experience. He wants us to experience that, to see that. So, consider that. That's as far as we're going to make it today. Seven verses isn't bad for a Sunday. We'll see if we can't finish the uh, chapter next week. But in, the, in this world of insanity that we live in, wherever you look, things are in crisis, it seems. Pray. Just pray. Don't get anxious. God's got it. He knows what he's doing. You know, I haven't got a clue. I, I, you know, the only solution I see with as crazy as our world is right now is that um, our wait, our eagerly waiting for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to His glorious body. The, that eagerly waiting is just about over. That's the only conclusion I can come to, as crazy as, as it is. But praise the Lord that He has saved us. He's washed our sin away. And that's what we're going to do now. We're going to remember that. Remember that Jesus did come. And he did go to the cross to pay the price for your sin and mine. Praise be to God. Guys, if you come, let's, uh, let's remember together.
Let's pray. Pray. <clears throat> pray together. Father, we do thank you for this time of communion. As we come together, we spend the time set aside by you for those who have trusted in you and saved you. And thank you for this bread representing a broken body, broken for us on the cross. We do pray that many will share with us today, many pastors will bring the message so that you'll know. We just pray that many will receive your Savior. And we just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 This body is broken for us. Let's remember. Dear Lord, we just do thank you for this time, Lord, that for taking this, Lord, and, and remember you. And Lord, we just think of uh, you giving your blood on the cross for each and every one of us, Lord. I pray that uh, those across the country that are partaking right now, Lord, would always remember, Lord, always reflect on it, and always think about what you did for each of us, Lord, so that we may be with you in heaven someday. We just thank you for all that you do, Lord, and just watch over us today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Sin is forgiven. Awesome. Let's remember. Thank you. 